do have the first name you get to bring up here that you'll claim on, on your side of this. Tyrese Maxey. You, 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 you did the smart thing. He's been awesome this year. He has been ascended this year. I think one of the lead creators in the league this year in a lot of ways. Yeah, he is averaging 26 points per game on uh, 59% true shooting, which is actually a little bit of a dip from last year, but obviously a huge bump in usage and assists. The crazy thing about Maxi and, and a lot of these guys, I know Halliburton gets a lot of attention for this, but it's true of Shea, it's true of Maxi. They do not turn the ball over. This guy turns the ball over on less than 7% of possessions. Mm-hmm. Like, you look at some players who have the usage that he has, who are one of the top two guys on a team, and, you know, some star players are around like 15% turnover rate. He's less than half of that. Uh, and that's that's really, really valuable. It doesn't always get closely looked at because it's not a, a sexy stat to check somebody's turnovers every night, but he just doesn't really make mistakes in that way. He's a dynamite three-point shooter. He's capable with Embiid off the court. Not that all that stuff factors into like, you know, most beat writers like all-star ballots, but you know, when you're trying to find on the margins, I think he's pretty much the most bulletproof case you could make here of any of the guys that could be first timers. Did you know who you had this in him? No, I didn't. I mean, I think when we did the preview, I was not super duper high on them or I wasn't super high on him. I, I kind of just figured like Embiid plus solid depth was good enough. And he's, He's played well enough to not be solid depth anymore. You know what I mean? It's like Embiid and Maxi is what you say when you're talking about the Sixers now, not Embiid and then Maxi and the depth. Like he's elevated himself to kind of be at least a 1B and he can get better from here. So, but this season, I think he's kind of done everything you would want him to do. He has the wins, he has the raw numbers, he has the value. It's all right there. So I think he'll be a very, very, uh, worthy first time all-star this season i'm going jalen brunson as, as my first one 26 a game 6.4 assists turnovers about where they were last year shooting pretty close to what he was last year when he was an all-star candidate as well that guy is just so trustworthy with the ball he's developed into just a really great lead creator a really great fulcrum of a team i don't know if necessarily the best guy on a great team, but is on high volume, doing everything for that next team offensively to shepherd them and make them work. I'm blown away by the craft that he plays with, Brendan. I, I just think Brunson is one of those guys that should be not straight. He, he, he plays at a position that is obviously so stacked that sometimes guys get squeezed out. There's a reason Mike Conley, most famously, I think, took forever to make an all-star team, even though he was that good and could have made one. But I, I'm going to go Jalen Brunson here as someone who's very deserving to make his first all-star team this year. Yeah, we thought he blew up last year, and he's taken another mini leap this year. 6.6 6, 6 three-point attempts mm -hmm. per game, 44% on them. And it just sort of feels like his, you mentioned kind of the pace part of it, like it just feels like he's in even more control. And I think we kind of started to see it in the playoffs last year. He had obviously some huge flashes against both Cleveland and Miami in the playoffs, but he's he's carried that forward, taken more of the threes that he needs to take, and he's another one of these guys that does not turn the damn ball over ever. 9.7% yeah. turnover rate. It's crazy to have the ball that much, be shooting that much, and be that efficient with each and every possession. Like, And he's like the, what, 10th best guard in the NBA? Like, we're in an insane era for this stuff right now. Mm -hmm. All right, who's your next one? All right, I'm going to go with, uh, speaking of guards... I will go with Desmond Bain. Yeah. We talked about him, so we don't have to elaborate too, too much, but it might even help his case that Ja went down again because it'll just kind of become more obvious that all of his numbers are in the context of just this awful team, you know? And to be as efficient as he's been and productive as he's been with nothing most nights around him offensively is super impressive. So... I think he's kind of due in that way, and we don't normally see awful teams get all-stars, but we know they're not truly that bad, and he has a reputation and pedigree that he'll bring. So I think he's sort of on the cusp of whether he would actually make it in, but I think he has the best case of the guys left. 
I'm going to go Paolo Bancaro with my next one. I am picking him as my Orlando of the two Orlando guys. I think you can make an argument for here. He's taken a big leap as a shooter. He's at 46.1% from the field this year. He's up to 38.5% on threes. He was at 30% last year. He's a bruising scorer. I think he's really hard to, he's even harder to guard now. His assists have jumped to nearly five a game from 3.7, with the turnovers only going up a half per game. That's a really impressive jump for me. This is just a budding star staring us in the face on, on one of the more fun young teams in the league to watch on a night to night basis. He's kind of does it all right now. He's playing heavy minutes. The jump has been there, the, the offensive control and, and feel for the game is there. I, I just love the season Powell is having, and I he's my he's my pick here. Yeah, I like it. I saw some chatter online about how Paolo, the, the net rating with him on the court is a negative, and they're like a plus 8 per 100 possessions, or plus 11 with him off. Just an interesting trend. But I do think that Orlando, especially, or I should say Paolo, during this stretch where Orlando has had to play one without Wagner, because I, it's probably only going to be one of the two that makes it. Mm-hmm. I probably would have leaned Franz before this, but now that he's been out and Paolo has been piling up these huge games, which they're being competitive. And in the case of the Denver game winning, mm-hmm. I think that'll help his resume. So he might've kind of taken the lead. If you're saying Orlando needs to have one all-star if they're in the top, you know, few of the East and which one of them is it going to be? I think Paolo might've kind of taken the lead there. So I like that. All right. Uh, staying in the East, Chris Epps, Porzingis. Technically not a first timer fully. He's never played in the game. I kind of think the time he made it, I think it was a fan vote thing when he was on the Knicks and then he got hurt and didn't play in the game. So I'm not sure that one, you know, is that allowed? Can we, can we give yeah, ourselves I'll, the for, grace for, to, yeah, uh, yeah. didn't count. play the game doesn't count. Yeah. Shouldn't have made it either. I mean, come on. He was like his third season, and, and he just got it because he played for the Knicks and is from Europe and probably had some you know, Latvian votes coming his way. He played 48 games that season, 23 points per game, whatever. Okay. This year, he's the second most valuable player on the best team in the NBA. There we yeah. go. Great answer. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I, I don't. I think I think there's a chance the Boston Celtics get four All Stars. I don't really know if it's gonna happen. They would be the first team since the 2014-15 Atlanta Hawks. And I'm just gonna go to Derek White, the the captain of the of the ball guys, one of the the winningest players in terms of how he plays and what he adds in the league this year. I I think honestly, due to a very good podcast hosted by a former NBA player. I think there has been like some unfair like online backlash to what Derek White is and in, in how he plays and what he's contributing. But that's just a winning player who does everything you could need. He's shooting the leather off the ball at all levels of the floor this year. He's at 16 a game, which isn't sound like a lot, but for him that's a career best. It's a big jump from last year. He is I mean he's probably the four he is I think the fourth guy on, on kind of what makes this team hum. But there's nights where he is absolutely instrumental, absolutely awesome. And he's just playing, I think, the best basketball his career on the best team in the NBA. So I just want to shout out there. He does all the stuff that wins you basketball games and can win you playoff series. So show him some love for that. And, and maybe they can, the Celtics can be a, a higher ceiling version of a Hawks team that could absolutely obliterate it in the playoffs that year. Just going to once again throw in that I think he might be the third most valuable player on the team, not the fourth. Brennan's trying to trade. Uh, um, Brennan's just out here trying to to trade uh, Jalen Brown, and that'll be the second thing Jalen Brown has demanded an investigation for this week. You yeah, saw that, I, correct? Uh, I did. Yeah, but he did kind of smack him. I mean, yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> so, yeah. give him that one. Uh, all right, I will go with um, Alperin Shengun. Mm. Talking about a five hundred ish team that is in contention to make the postseason for in the Western Conference. Shengun is averaging 22, nine and five on 54% shooting from the field. He has like a two to one assist to turnover ratio. He's very clearly the best player on the Rockets to me. I don't even not the more we watch this team, the, the more clear that is right. I think the one case you would make is even when he's on the court, their offensive rating is only 117. Not quite like the elite of the elite, but he's a young guy and they're winning anyway. And I think his defense has taken a step forward too. So if you're talking about a 
solid, valuable two-way player on a good team that's postseason bound, typically that player makes the all-star team. So it might seem kind of crazy that he would do it so quickly and he's not the flashiest dude. He's not the most hyped guy, but I think he could very easily be on a lot of people's ballots. I think it's very possible. I think it's interesting that he's the first guy from his draft class that we've come up with here. Um, not obviously as high of a pick as a lot of the guys was a first rounder, but not the pedigree of some of the other guys. I'm going to pick a guy from this draft class. I'm going to go Scotty Barnes. I think Scotty Barnes just is having a breakout year. I think he has been the head of that draft class for me as of this point. He's kind of at the head of that 2021 group. He is, I think, part of the reason why Toronto maybe finally felt comfortable to move on from OG and just really going to start resetting the roster. His growth has spurred something within an organization and what that roster is going to look like. In the level up is here as a creator, as a lead guy on an offense. I can't wait to see how far he can push it. I can't wait to see what other moves they make to accentuate what he does. So I, I for me, I go Scotty Barnes. I think he's been one of the breakout younger guys in the league. Even if it's on a team that isn't winning as much, that maybe drives playoffs, all star voting. But that's a guy that is having a really, really great year. And again, another guy that has improved his shot. He's shooting thirty eight point two percent from three this year. He was at thirty percent as a rookie. He was at twenty eight percent last year, and he's taking nearly six threes a game. That's a whole new player that has come out of that one thing. It's unbelievable to watch him just actually blossom as a shooter in that way, assuming that it holds for the rest of the year. Absolutely. I think Maxi and Brunson have the winning and the track record a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Barnes maybe should have been the third pick in this. Yeah. Thing. I think he I has a lo- better case. Maybe Porzingis because he's on a great team and he's a vet. But Barnes probably has a better case than a lot of guys who we picked before him. Yes. All right, your last pick. He's the best player on on his team. I mean... Yeah. He's like a legitimate, positive, two-way player. That's that's pretty crazy. Do I have one more? Is there any, I don't yeah. think there's anybody left. Um, so we did... I've done White, Brunson, Bancaro, and Scotty. So we've done four each, I believe. Let's just cut it at four then. Because I All think right. we're going to finish our whole list if we... Uh, yeah. If we... And I don't, I don't actually believe anymore, so I can't, I'm not, not going to be able to make the case. We had Mikhail Bridges on here. Yeah, I, I'll, don't, I'll, yeah. I, just, I don't think he's an all-star. Uh, I, I don't think he... I don't think the offense is there enough, the efficiency enough, the team success, whatever. And we had Chet Holmgren on this list, who... If he wasn't a rookie, would he just be a shoe in Are we just holding against him that it's not like his time yet? Yeah, that's why I think you should just put him on here. I think that I think you're cowarding out yeah. of not picking him, honestly. Cuz I don't think he's going to be an all-star. Yeah, but I think it's so I, I think to, it's I think it's know. about the the chances, the case, making making the argument, you know, it's about about the, the, well, the case he's, side. is he's one of the most valuable on-off players in the entire NBA and he like I I feel like we're already kind of taking him for granted what he's able to just peel off some of these random nights like I know they played the Wizards on Monday but he just scored 30 on like 70% shooting from the field and it was just like yeah okay it's just a Chet box score it's just what he does now you know what I mean um so yeah I mean he's a great player I, I he feels like one of those guys where if he doesn't make it which I don't again don't probably think he will it'll be playoff time and some person will go on like a monologue on an NBA <laughs> podcast of like, he should have been an all-star. Or, Why did we overlook him? Whatever. And they'll be right. But I don't, history tells us he's, he might not even make it next year unless he's great. Like we make these guys wait so long before we let them kind of get there, whatever. It's kind of yeah. goofy, but I think it's uh it's going to happen. So we're going to wrap, wrap this up by looking at, is there someone not in the running that we're disappointed they aren't? I'm just going to say, I think Jamal Murray has, would, if he'd been a little bit healthier, I think would have had a case. I think he's had a sneaky, really good season on a really good team. I just think he maybe is not going to ultimately be healthy enough to to get there. The numbers, I think, are there. He's shooting forty, like nearly 42% from three. He's averaging 20 a game. He's averaging six assists. His turnovers are down a little bit. I think he's having the year qualitatively, but he's only at 24 games. So I think that's to me where it it's like a health thing with him, which is not a new story for him, obviously. Um, it, it's been a little up and down from health-wise the last several years. And it, that's just, he's just going to miss some time. And I think that holds him back in this. If I have a name, Evan, oh God, it gets it, Evan again. If I had a name, it is Evan Mobley that I'm disappointed that it's not on the list. I know he's hurt right now. 
but the leap has not come. It has come for Sangoon. It has come for Scotty Barnes. Hasn't come for Evan Mobley before he got hurt. And it, it, it raises some, I think, philosophical questions about where he's at in the him and Allen pairing and a bunch of different things in Cleveland that we can get into at some point. But I think it's a little disappointing to me that before the injury, I didn't feel like there was a massive leap for Evan Mobley that came. And I, I kind of, I thought he, I had predicted coming into there, this was a guy that was going to break out and have an all-star season this year. And it just wasn't happening before he went down. Yeah, we'll definitely do our 2021 draft retrospective at some point. And we've gotten into like five guys in this episode alone that it's a really interesting have class. interesting a, situations. Yeah. yeah. I'll throw Victor Wimanyama out there as somebody that I think in another world could have had a real case, even with what I was just saying about Chet and how we make guys wait. Chet, or Wemby is a little bit of a unique case, I think, because he, uh, we don't seem to want to make him wait for anything right now. No, he was, he was put on like the, he was put in the red zone, like coming into the league for all this stuff. I think. Yeah. So I have a hypothetical for you though. If we look mm. back to the lottery last summer, do you remember the other two teams that had top three odds to get him equal to what the Spurs had? Pistons or one? Yeah. Was it Charlotte? It was Houston. Oh, boy. If he ended up in Houston, where everything else about their summer was the same, maybe mm-hmm. they don't go so overboard with, like, you know, Jeff Green's contractor, Jock Landale, because they have Victor, but they signed Van Vliet, they signed Brooks, most importantly. And they have the structure to obviously make... I know Shengun's on that team, but I think they could play together. They obviously have a structure to make their young players develop, as Shengun is indicating. Would Vic be an all-star in that world? I think it's, I think it's possible because he's on a team that just... A, maybe he's more unleashed in that situation just because he would be kind of on a team that is caring about winning and the Spurs, I don't think, actively care about winning. You know, he doesn't always play a ton of minutes. Um, they haven't played a real point guard for a lot of the season. They have, you know, they do have more wins than the Pistons, but that's the only team they have more wins than. And having seen them both recently, I don't think the Spurs are actually worse than the Wizards. I think they're just kind of like not fully on the gas pedal. Maybe with the Rockets, he would have been fully on the gas pedal unless in the All-Star conversation. I think that's possible just because everything they did all year for the last year was we want to win basketball games. We want to be a serious team. That would have probably led to, to Wemby playing more games and, and being in a situation where he's th- done that. I will say it's just it's kind of nice in some ways to see him get to be in a situation where he's getting to get his feet a little bit. And I think also the roster is ultimately going to make more sense around him. And it's also like I say, even if Sangoon and him could have played together, I don't know if Sangoon's having this season that's been really fun to watch and a breakout if it's him and Wemby on the same team. Like, I just think that would, there, there'd be some friction there just kind of naturally based on position and, and what those guys do. And I just want to now see Vic play the five, which we're finally starting to see because Zach Collins is hurt. And I just kind of want to see him play the at the five with a real point guard a lot in this first team. That's yeah, kind of where my, my heart's it, at. It would have been a, it would have been a slog, I think. I, and that, yeah. that would have created, I think we are, if, if we maybe think Vic would have had an all-star case, I think we already also, in that hypothetical, would have been having arguments about if they needed to trade Shen Goon. So, yes. you know, you take the good with the bad. I also think Kimei Odoka, there's a very real world where he just, like, benched Vic in, like, six fourth quarters along the first two months of the season, and we all are just angry about a whole different way of handling the Vic rookie yeah, season experience. I, I, so I also just feel like the energy that Dylan Brooks puts in the world and that Victor Womanyama puts in the world are, like, two things that maybe can't exist in the same plane at the same time, you know? Mm-hmm. Vic yeah. seems like a little a little more like chill, and then Dylan Brooks is Dylan Brooks. Yeah, there's probably not. It, it probably wasn't going to happen as a rookie, but I also just want to take every opportunity to express how frustrating this year one has been for Victor because it's just it's like actively not fun to watch most nights, even with how incredible he is, and that just kind of sucks. Yeah, because he's when I saw him in person, he kind of like dis like he comes in and it's a big deal, and then he kind of like sometimes disappears in the game a little bit because he's just like the team like he's out for long stretches and he sometimes he just isn't impacting the game directly, and then he has like four possessions in a row where you're like, oh my god, I've never seen this before, 
You know, it's it's freakish yeah. how he just. It's not he jumps into it. It's not like he's like waiting and passive. It's just I think his position and I think that team kind of means that there's times where he's not there. And then you see like the Bucks game, and it's like holy shit. When it's just like isolating specific things he can flash, like blocking Giannis one on one or transition dunks or you know it's like then you see it but they're just such a mess of a team that can't string it together because they can't stick with what works a lot of the time and it's just uh it's frustrating but hopefully hopefully they're right and this pans out for the betterment of everybody long term and you know we all look back on it as oh that was actually the right move but i'm not convinced we'll see